when she moved with her family to Connecticut. After working as a freelance journalist and screenwriter for 20 years in six different countries, she wrote her first novel, Away From You, in 2014. This deeply personal account of a woman confronting the demons of her childhood in Kenya, including an abusive alcoholic father, was long listed for the Orange Award and the Impact Award. The following year, she and her husband, the wildlife filmmaker Matt Aberhard, moved to a remote region of Tanzania to make Disney Nature's hunting flamingo epic, The Crimson Wing. During the filming, Melody became a medic to the local Maasai community and established the Natron Healthcare Project to bring sustainable healthcare to the area. Her second novel, The Gloaming, which we have here as well as The Underneath, they are both checked out. Please don't ask them for this evening. That's a good thing, they're out. The Gloaming was a New York Times notable book and a finalist for the 2017 Vermont Book, of book Award. In The Gloaming, published The Shame in the UK, Melanie chartered her broken character's journeys through Tanzania in the aftermath of a random tragedy. Her new literary thriller, The Underneath, is primarily set in rural Vermont in our region. Many familiar names in there and places where she now lives with Matt, their twin daughters, and maybe she can update this, two old dogs, a fat rabbit, two rats, two budgies, three very old horses. I think she said a lot of those have, those animals have passed. <laughs> a hermit crab called Shelby and innumerable caterpillars, tadpoles, and beetles. She continues to work in Tanzania, focusing on healthcare education for illiterate people. Please welcome Melanie Finn. Thank you, Bob. Um, and I just wanted to, to double check that is the haunting flamingo epic, not the hunting flamingo epic. That would have. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I was like, just to make sure we were not <laughs> hunting, that would have been a different film um, uh, yet to be made. Um, anyway, thank you for coming out tonight. And I definitely see a couple of familiar faces. So thank you for coming. And I appreciate it's really bad weather. Uh, Bob and I have just been complaining. Um, it's like we've skipped two, like two entire months. We're in the middle of January now. Like I don't know what happened to the end of October and the middle of November. It's just gone. So um, anyway, so I really appreciate it coming out on such a cold night. Um, and um, I am fairly new to public speaking, so it's great at the end if you feel like you could give me any feedback on some of the things that worked or didn't work or that I could strengthen. Um, talking about your own work is sort of um, difficult. But I, I really wanted to um, talk about this particular issue of being an outsider um, writing in. Um, I've been an outsider pretty much all my life. Uh, I was born in Kenya the year after independence, um, so I immediately became an outsider. I moved to Connecticut when I was 11 um, with my family, and um, I was the only kid who didn't know who the Rolling Stones were. I barely knew who the Beatles were, so I was kind of like an outside freak. And I have constantly, through my life, sought places where I am the outsider. So that's the great thing about living in the Northeast Kingdom is me and my children can be outsiders for the next seven generations, so we are all set. Um, <laughs> um, and actually, the theme of this kind of came from a, a talk I did about a month ago at the Woodstock Library when I had been focusing more on the process of writing. And um, one of the people in the audience, turned out she was from this area, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm from there, and she said, do you, you know, I haven't read your book, but, you know, do you feel like you're exploiting people in the Northeast Kingdom as you write about them? And I thought that was a really interesting question. Um, there's a lot going on in literary and art circles about cultural appropriation. And I, so I really had to think about that. Like, if I'm the outsider and I'm writing in a really personal way about lives in the Northeast Kingdom that are not my own, 
um, how, how, how do I make that, how do I justify that? Can, can I justify it? Um, so at least part of this uh, talk today is, is going to uh, deal with that. Um, so um, the first question people always ask is, uh, where do you get your inspiration, right? And it would be fantastic to believe that, like St. Paul, on the road to Damascus, I just sat down and this incredible, fully formed vision came to me, and all I had to do was sit down and write. That would be great. Um, but it's much more insidious than that. It comes in like these weird drips and drabs, and you kind of end up piecing something together out of a bunch of disparate stuff that somehow coheres. Um, and one of the first things, and I'm sorry this is a terrible slide, um, I am a great fan of the Caledonia record. Um, in particular, the, the uh, page two and three were all the terrible crimes to um, but So this picture um, was on page three of a, of a trailer home that had been abandoned in, in Glover. Um, and um, they never really discovered the, who owned this trailer or like where it was going or what happened. But something about this just began to obsess me. Clearly somebody had this trailer home and they were thinking of it as a place where they might live. And they were obviously trying to take it from one place to another. This was someone's home. And it looks like, from reading the story, it, it fell off the truck bed that it was being towed on. And then somebody just drove away and left it. Um, and my first thought is, oh, it's quite funny. And it's quite quaint. And oh, isn't this you know, so like rural? And then I thought, well, you know, actually, the reality is that somebody just reached the end of their resources. This was their home. They lacked the money to have somebody proper with, with a proper truck move it from point A to point B, so they got their friend down the road, Fred, to do it. And it fell off Fred's truck. And they didn't have any more money. They didn't have any more resources. They didn't have anywhere else to go. So they literally just had to walk away from it. I don't know if that's the truth. But I felt like this was a picture of despair. Somebody had just had to leave the place they were intending to live and have to make some other kind of desperate arrangement. So when I started to think about the lives we know many people are living in the kingdom, this despair is out there. Um, in the book, um, there is a pig. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> read the pig. Um, Farmer Willie's pig. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh gosh, let me see. I've, I've got to find it now. For some reason, it's the one thing that I haven't marked. Uh, anyway, this pig, in fact, this is not Farmer Willie, and this is not Farmer Willie's pig, but I did go online to look for big pigs. And this, this, this picture, this picture came up. Um, oh. Hold on a second. I had everything in here so neatly marked. Here it is. So this is her introduction to, this is Kay, um, who is the heroine, anti-heroine of the book. Um, I should probably at this point, many of you haven't read the book. So the underneath is the story of Kay, uh, who is a former journalist, war correspondent, who led quite a glamorous and dangerous life um, until she married her husband um, and had two kids. And since then, she's been pretty grounded. Um, they live in London, and they've come to Vermont for the summer and rented an idyllic farmhouse where their intention is to um, rekindle their marriage and you know, have a healthy space for the kids to run around in. Within weeks of arriving, her husband is called away uh, to um, on location for one of the films that he's making, and she's left alone in this house with these kids. She very soon discovers some creepy things about the house, some even creepier things about the locals, and she bumps into um, a man called Ben, um, who has many problems of his own. Um, ben is a uh, logger um, who is making extra money um, as a drug trafficker, and he is also trying to adopt um, a young boy, Jake, who comes from a very troubled background. Um, but I'll start with the pig. Uh, so Kay has followed this, this character, Eamon, who is a very nasty person, to his house. And here we go. 
After several hundred meters, the track opened into a small yard. Eamon's old truck complemented the rest of the rusting, decaying junk. Long, defunct snowmobiles, log splitter, aluminum livestock troughs, haphazard piles of wood, steel, and plastic. There were also two constructions, like gallows, slung with chains that Kay guessed were for hanging dead animals, deer, bear, coyotes, and not far, a steel cable slung between two trees for the drying coyote skins. A farmhouse reared out of this debris, more concept than form, as if the wind had spun around one day and thrown bits of plywood and old, broken windows together. A blue tarp comprised the roof. The siding was gone along the north exterior wall. The door was open. In the back of the car, Tom and Freya, those are Kay's children, uh, slumbered on. Kay got out, picked her way across the grass and up the rickety steps. There was an animal stench coming from the occluded interior. She entered. Eamon? In the dim corner, an enormous mound moved and grunted. Yeah. Mind him, Eamon said, and dipped an empty coffee can into an open bag of cat food by his chair and chucked it in that direction. It was a pig, bloated, vast, and tusked. The pig shuffled toward the scatter of cat food. He can move faster than you think if you piss him off, Eamon warned as he opened himself a beer and leaned back. His chair was a recliner covered in a hide all sins brown corduroy. Kay noticed the dainty chintz prints of the sofa and scanned the room for a sense of Eamon's history. Who, for instance, might have been responsible for the chintz? Every surface and inch of the floor was obscured by an accretion of litter, including, from the smell, pig shit. So opposite to the Wilsons that it almost became the same thing, a purposeful obliteration of anything personal. She wondered now if this was said something about Eamon himself that his scruffy varmint was not default, but a careful obfuscation. So the pig does appear several times in the movie. And um, this is, was a neighbor's pig. And we went into their house and, and this enormous animal, um, apparently now too big to go outside or move. <laughs> so, um, my girls and I were fascinated by this pig that has since died. And um, I've always wondered, how did they get it, how did they get it out? Anyway, so somehow I knew a pig had to feature. Um, but the real sort of crux of this was um, I had been house-sitting uh, for friends of my mother down in, 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 in South Stratford. And they were a really lovely couple, both professionals. Um, they had four lovely kids. Um, you know, just the kind of people that you would like to have to dinner and feel safe around. I was house sitting for them and it was chilly night so I went through the house looking for a blanket and I found a closet in one of the bedrooms and I opened it up and instead of a blanket there was a hole in the back of the closet wall that had to have been made by a fist. It was the shape of a fist and it was fist height right in the back of the wall and I thought hmm, that's really interesting um, and, but it, it didn't stop there. In the closet itself, there was this weird graffiti. Um, I can't quite remember what it was, but it was, it was creepy. It was like disturbing. There were, it wasn't just like, you know, like, oh, my wife's an old bag or something. It was really, I, I couldn't tell. It, it wasn't a child, I could tell that, but I, I didn't know who had written it. It seemed like another voice than either of the two adults in the house. And, and this disturbed me. I, I hadn't had my own kids yet. And it disturbed me that there could be this, this brilliant exterior, this lovely house, this professional couple who drove a Volvo and a BMW, and they had a house in Kennebunkport, and, and all of these things. But there was some secret, some, something brewing underneath that wasn't right. So I wanted to really address that. It, it interested me, and it interested me even more as I became a mother. Um, Vermont is quintessentially this beautiful small town, lovely trees, chocolate box, Vermont life, uh, moonlight in Vermont. There's this perception of what Vermont is. But those of us who live here, we know that that's not the case. We know about the underneath, right? We know about the, the state's spooky house. We know about the spooky writing 
in, in the state's, in our state's closet, in every closet that our town has. We know about the underneath. We know that it's there. And we know that this is not so much a lie as just a very, very small part of the truth. So um, when it became a mother, there's this idea that gets fed to you, a bit like that picture of Vermont, of what it's going to be like. Um, uh, I never had boobs this size, but, um, <laughs> but of course, almost immediately, it was not this. My kids were born prematurely. Um, they were on oxygen for the first four months, and you know things were really difficult. I didn't sleep. Uh, we were struggling for money. In fact, it was horrible. I cannot look back on those first five months and remember anything that even approximates joy. Um, I was just talking with my friend Sarah here, our kids go to school, and I just said, you know, I'm so sick of shouting at my kids. It's like, I know everything. I know they're going to be gone. I know I love them. I know they're trying. But I just hear myself shouting at them all the time. Where are your boots? Where's your homework? Why haven't you done this? What, you know, like, where's your coat? Where are the snow pants? This is the second. And it just goes on and on, like this, this whining, nagging dialogue. And I hate myself. And I wanted this, right? I wanted this. <laughs> and it's not real. Like, this is just n n never going to happen, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe that, that moment when you had that baby and the baby was asleep and you had managed to sleep for five hours, you were like, oh, this is great. You know? Or the other day, very sadly, one of our dogs died and I was in total tears. And my lovely daughter, Pearl, she came and comforted me. And I was, she's nine, and I was so profoundly touched by that. But those instances seem so rare. So in creating Kay, the main character, I, I wanted to create a woman who was really struggling with motherhood, with her expectations of motherhood and what it had turned out to be. Um, I'm just going to read a quick um, section from the book uh, about Kay, um, who, who is in this struggle, um, which I'm sure some of you will recognize from your own experiences. Um, so she's, she's just finishing up a phone call with Michael, uh, her glamorous husband. Um, how are you? Fine. We're all fine. And you? Delayed in Schiphol, severe winds over the Sahara, flights are cancelled. Kay wondered if this was a euphemism for a boutique hotel in Amsterdam, two days with Barbara, the woman that she thinks her husband's having an affair with, wandering the canals arm in arm. I'd better go, he said. She didn't hang up right away. She was certain there must be something else to say. He was still speaking, but it took her a moment to grasp that he was not speaking with her, his voice muffled. Accidentally, he hadn't disconnected the call. He was saying, has Morton got those permissions yet? To someone else. To Barbara? Has Morton got those permissions yet? His life out there. His action man life with permissions, permits, locations, sandstorms in the Sahara. While she groveled on her knees, disinterring apple cores from the sofa. Did Barb, in her chic Italian culottes, know what happened to a doll's hair if you held it over an open flame? Did she know it wouldn't go nice and curly? Rather, it would shrink and wad in a stinking mass, and the doll's face wilt like old wax. Did she know how to comfort a child holding this burn victim Barbie? The pathos required? Kay swallowed hard. Her bitterness appalled her. She ushered her children toward the car, as if there was urgency, purpose. But there was only dinner and the savage mortality of motherhood. Um, so, yeah, so, so Kay has some things that she needs to, to work through. Um, and then I put this up because, of course, this is more realistic uh, idea of what <laughs> motherhood is to most of us. In fact, um, the day that I did this talk in Woodstock, one of my children had put an apple down the toilet. No explanation, no idea. And an apple is actually really hard to get out with a plunger, so um, it took some time. Um, and then there are moments when I feel like this. I literally go outside, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going mad. I, 
I cannot quite explain the rage and self-disappointment when I'm unhappy with my children. I feel like I'm going mad. I feel like I'm collapsing inward. And I don't know what to do with that feeling. And I think there's this false image put out of how we're supposed to be. And so when we're not that as mothers, we feel like we should be committed to an insane asylum. But I really think that, that actually this is a perfectly normal feeling, right? To act on it, to act on that feeling is something else. But to feel that, that rage and that obliteration of yourself, I think is completely normal. Um, so uh, I did want to slightly veer off slightly to talk about this idea of cultural appropriation. Uh, I don't know if anybody um, is familiar with this painting. It's been quite uh, um, in the press uh, quite a lot recently. Um, it is a painting of Emmett Till by the artist Dana Schultz. Um, and she is a white artist, and Emmett Till was a young black man who was killed in the 60s um, in a racial incident. And this painting became the storm of controversy of cultural appropriation. How could this white woman uh, paint a picture of a young uh, black man? So one of the things that I find tricky when this woman at the last lecture I had given talked about that idea of appropriating culture, um, I, I really had to start thinking about that. Like, well, what does that mean when I write about somebody who is not like me, who is completely different from me, a different sociological background, a socioeconomic background, a different gender? Um, in my previous book, The Gloaming, I had a, uh, a black woman doctor. Um, and I did find a few comments on Amazon about how dare I write about a black woman. And I was sort of surprised, because I thought, well, you know, where are these lines drawn? Like, if I only had to write about myself, it would get pretty boring. We'd go back to the previous slides. Um, and that's not really a book. Um, so I kind of did some research about this, uh, and I'm by no means an expert because I have more questions than answers. So this is the, the definition that, that came up uh, in an article about um, Lionel Shriver, who is famous for writing the book, uh, we, need to talk about Ke we Need to Talk About Kevin. Is that, uh, anybody remember that book? Um, and um, anyway, uh, Lionel Shriver gave a whole talk about cultural appropriation, and she upset a lot of people. And I read her lecture, and actually it was a little bit dismissive, but this was a, a, a quote that she had come up with. Appropriation and authenticity in American law. Susan Scafidi, a law professor at Fordham University, who for the record is white, defines cultural appropriation as taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. This can include unauthorized use of another's cultures, dance, dress, music, language, folklore, cuisine, traditional medicine, religious symbols, etc. So I looked at this and I thought, wow, <laughs> this, if you're a writer and you're trying to write about anybody but yourself, you, you're, you're stuck. Um, and as I read this, I'm like, okay, without permission. So if I'm going to write about people in the Northeast Kingdom, who do I go and get permission from? Because I'm not writing about a specific person. My characters are made up. They are from my imagination. So should I like go and stand on the corner in Lindenville and say, can you give me permission to write about? Like, I don't even understand how how this could happen, how the practical application of this is. And then I said, uh, had other questions like, well, how do we even define culture, which is a, a mur another murky thing. I mean, entire theses and universities or courses are set aside to, to creating these definition of culture and, and what is it? And it, it's so, it's such a manifest, it's constantly reshaping itself. I was at a, a, a meeting in Kirby Mountain, um, in Kirby, uh, a town hall meeting there. They're trying to put a bike route through on the road, and the local residents were up, up in arms, we don't want any change, we don't need bikers in Kirby, blah, blah, blah. 
And there was somebody there who was from the biking community who said, well, you know, you really need to understand there's nearly 10 different types of mountain bikers. There's not just one group of mountain bikers. So even when we talk about mountain bikers, there's not just mountain bikers as a culture. There's 10 different pods of mountain bikers within that culture. So, and this isn't to say that I, I can just write willy-nilly about who I want to write about, or, but it's, it becomes almost paralyzing as a writer. What can I appropriate? I look at Northeast Kingdom, and it has a culture. I'm not sure how I would define that culture. I'm not sure how I would prescribe it in terms of folklore or, or language or dress or music. I do know that at the beginning of deer hunting season, when I go into whites, 90% of people are wearing camouflage, even the babies, right? So, like, and, and, the, and that has its own folklore about it. Like, we're independent, and we live off the land, and we hunt. And, but when I wanted to write about this, I was, I didn't think about that. But I think about it now. Um, the first, very first reading I gave uh, at um, Norwich Bookstore, uh, I read a section um, in which I describe a fat man. And it's quite a complicated scene, lots of things happen. And I finished reading and everyone looked very impressed. And the first question was from a gentleman over there, who actually I know, and he's quite portly, and he put his hand up and he said, why did you describe him as fat? And I, I was sort of flummoxed. I wasn't expecting that question. And then there was a woman sitting here who was also quite large. And she said, um, under her breath to me, she said, careful. And I, <laughs> and I, I had to think, why had I described him as a fat man? Like, what was the point? And you're trying to do this really quickly. Like, you know, there hasn't been any buffering questions like, oh, I really love that, you know, but, you know, blah, blah. It was like, why did you call him a fat man? And I really didn't have an answer. I, to me, it had been a descriptor. It was an adjective. It was merely a word. To somebody else, it had become something negative. Like, what was I trying to say about him being fat? Like, what was his weight? have anything to do with what happened in the scene. It had nothing to do. He wasn't a sumo wrestler. He, he didn't use his weight in, in any scene. He did absolutely nothing being fat. He could have been thin. He could have been muscular. So I really had to think about, like, oh my god, why did I choose that adjective? And I have never gone back through a book and thought through so much of this stuff as I did with the underneath. Because I live here now. And if I want to write another book here, I have to think carefully about it. I can't leave and go somewhere else. I'm going to meet the people that I, I'm writing collectively about everywhere I go. So the only thing I could come up with with why I'd call him a fat man was because when I go to Crystal Lake, which is where the scene was set, generally there are a lot of large people there. And, but even that, then you open that Pandora's box. Well, what are you saying by that? And to be honest, I don't know. I, I have really no idea. But I know that I will be very difficult for me in the next book to describe anyone as fat or thin. Because <laughs> I'll feel like I'm, I'm going to depth charge something. Um, so, um, um, there's another problem with uh, writing, which is not necessarily connected to cultural appropriation, but it's, it's how people perceive you as a writer, that you are writing about them. Um, and I have a family, my husband has a family, I have friends, um, and my brother-in-law uh, point blank refused to read this book, because in the opening scene between Kay and her husband, she's moving behind him in a basement, holding a hammer over his head and imagining smashing his head in. Um, <laughs> my my brother-in-law said that he was offended and he couldn't read beyond that. And I was so horrified to think that he would think that was me and that Michael is Matt. I know he has the same initial. I know he's a filmmaker. But at a certain point, you're, you're trying to find that weird dialectic of 
your own experience, your own self, your own feelings, the things you want to explore in your own self, and that in huge exterior world that is constantly feeding you ideas and thoughts and, and dialogue and characters. So um, it is difficult to be a writer. You are always going to offend somebody. Um, and the best thing to do is just not read the one-star comments on your Goodreads. <laughs> The only other thing that I did want to say about this, I really worry about the creation of they categories. Um, I taught briefly at the uh, Linden Institute here for a year. I taught a 10th grade general, um, general level um, English American literature class, which was both fascinating and complete hell. Um, there were kids in the class who could barely write a sentence, and there were extremely bright kids who had behavioral problems, and there were mediumly bright kids who didn't want to take honors because they were doing five different sports and drama club. Um, so one of the things that I talked about with these kids was this idea of, of what is they, because they would often come like, why did they hate us, meaning Muslims? Why did, why did they hate us, meaning Russians? So we talked a lot about this idea of they. Um, and I think that the problem with this cultural appropriation thing is that it creates they's that don't exist. Groups are not cohesive. I cannot speak for every sexually harassed woman out there. I might find something in common with them, but our experiences are too diverse. So I really worry about what this is doing both to the creative in the creative fields, but also to us as a, as a culture. Like, we're suddenly pigeonholing people in, in, in these little they categories, both from the outside and from the inside, both the perpetrators of cultural appropriation and the, the sufferers, the, the victims, the, I don't know what that word might be without causing offense, um, the a, a, appropriated people. Um, so, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I did want to um, finally come round to is Nadine Kornemer was one of my favorite writers and a huge inspiration. And what she did say is that you have to recognize yourself and others. So your job as a writer really is to be a cipher for human experience. Um, we are all human. We have immense humanity connecting us. It's not always good and it's not always bad. But if you're able to recognize yourself and other people, that's what you write about. When I wrote about Dorothea and the gloaming, a black woman doctor, I wasn't writing about her as a black person. I was writing about her as a woman missing her kids, struggling to be a doctor. And because she lived in Africa, she was black. I was writing about her humanness, not her blackness. Um, there's uh, one section of this book where I make that, quite, that point quite strongly. Um, Kay, in her previous life, was uh, hell-bent on interviewing um, a notorious uh, militia leader um, in the middle of Africa called General Christmas, who was a, is a very bad character, just constantly you know, like doing really atrocious things. The word atrocity um, was sort of invented by him. But there's a parallel between him and, of course, the character Eamon, and even to a lesser extent, to what Kay and Ben themselves find themselves capable of doing. Uh, I'm just going to read you a, a quick uh, bit of dialogue between Kay as she interviews um, as she interviews General Christmas. If I can find it. I swear, I'd like to blame my children for the fact that I seem to have lost all my page numbers. Um, because usually I can, the scissors, the, but here it is. Okay. So, Kay has been invited by General Christmas to this backwater in the middle of the Congo to interview him. And she is at this point uh, about six or seven months pregnant. You think that there's you and there's me, there's what you do and what I do, he says. 
You want me to say there isn't? That given a set of circumstances, I could round up a group of school children and burn them to death in a church? I don't believe I could ever do that, says Kay. I'm disappointed in your lack of imagination, Kay. You want to understand? Then imagine. You are in a different world to mine, Kay. A gated community, a real passport. You don't know. You haven't the faintest idea what you would do in my situation. Your innocence is just a failure of imagination. Others in your exact same circumstance don't. But he cut me off, his hand coming off the armrest like a knife. Where I am, who I am, here, now, the accumulation of what I have done and what has been done to me. I cannot be anyone else. Kay says, you could meet the, with the opposition. You could sign a, a peace treaty with Museveni. He would give you amnesty. Ha! He'd give me amnesty with the crocodiles in Lake Victoria. You know that. So, she says, you keep killing, then, to avoid dying yourself? Because we are in a war, Kay, that you perpetuate, she says. That would perpetuate itself. As long as there are people, there will be war. This is basic. He shook his head. He was getting bored. What is it, then, that you want to tell me? Because you did bring me here, not just to repay me for my efforts. Tell me, tell me, she says. We were back again to his expansive smile. Okay, I admit, I heard you were pregnant. I wondered to myself, this white woman, how white people think they are special. Will she come all this way to see a man who cuts babies out of the belly? I held his gaze, impassive. Am I a trophy? Not yet, he says. Um, so, um, going back to that image of the spooky house and the image of uh, the pristine New England, I think every day we see this um, kind of evil uh, among us. It's not something that we just find in psycho killers in Africa. Um, oh, oh, here's the fat man with the barbecue. I forgot all about him. <laughs> And the funniest thing is, I actually went online to look for images, and I was like, fat man, fat, fat, a fat men bar a barbecuing, right? And you wouldn't believe, there was almost no images of fat men barbecuing. Nearly all of them were thin men barbecuing. And I was like, what? How can they? And then, but then finally, there was, there was John Goodman barbecuing. I think it's Fred, Fred Flintstone. So I have to see what other slides I've. Ah, so. Um, so then this was something else I was going to just quickly talk about, the, the, the moving on from the cultural appropriation. Um, the construction of a novel is this hugely complex thing. We don't just sit down and write something in a couple of weeks. It takes, it takes months. It takes a huge amount of work. You, you have to so completely inhabit your characters. They have to be so authentic that the idea that you are culturally appropriating somebody without understanding them is almost impossible if it's going to be a good book. If it's a bad book, it reads false. It's a bit like if you're watching a, a great movie or you're enjoying it, something on Netflix, and it's about a really smart, sassy female lawyer. And she's on the, the trail of a, of a killer, and she's found out all this information, but the killer's on the loose, and she comes home, and she turns on the light, but the light doesn't work. So what does she do? She gets a flashlight and goes into the basement to look at the fuse box. Now, at that point, I'm, I'm done. Like, there is no way an intelligent woman with a killer out there is gonna come into her house, find the light not working, and go into the basement. So when we create characters, they have to be authentic. They have to become themselves. They have to be real from beginning to middle to end. You have to fight with them. So this is the, the working part. I have all these men working, because when I looked for a picture of women working, <laughs> this is what I got. Like, I looked like men constructing, and we got that. And then women constructing, this is apparently women constructing. Um, so this is the book, right? This is the work. It is not a simple thing. This is probably, and I'm not kidding, about how much paper it takes to write a book. You probably write 12 drafts from beginning to middle and end. So within that, those characters and their stories become so real and so densely packed with their own lives. 
And that would be my argument against cultural appropriation. If I was ever to write a gay black character, which is completely something I would never think about, but by the time that gay black character came to my pages, there would be something in him, his humanity, his humanness, whatever it was, that I would recognize as mine. So um, anyway, thank you very much for coming today. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. There's no time on here. How am I doing, Bob? In the microphone, man. You're the microphone man. Um, and if there's time and no questions, um, I, I'll do I'll do a reading. But let's do questions because I've been talking a lot. Blah blah. Thank I you. Think that question from that woman was totally unfair. Uh, totally unfair. And I don't think you should even take a, a second to think about it. Um, every author is writing about if they're writing fiction, it's a fictional character. Archie Mayer, who lives in Vermont, he's not an outsider. He appropriates all the time. Names of places we all know, but it's fiction. It comes from him. So when I believe when an author is writing, it comes from some part of you. Well, some I, part of you gets gets into this book and makes a character. And that's where all that that um, artistic um, the intellect, the uh, what your imagination does. It's not a creation. It, it can be. Uh, I just think that question was totally unfair. Because we're so politically correct. We can't say a darn thing without getting in trouble. Even if we're trying to be so careful. We can't. We can choke on it. But we can't do it. It is impossible now in this world we live in. It's too bad. Well, I will say um, that two of my favorite books about women, um, Anna Karenina and Madame Bovary, have of course been <laughs> written by men. But one of the most successful series of all times, Sex in the City, also written largely by men. Um, so I have to say, like, when I hear that, I'm like, I don't like the fact that they wrote, men wrote sex in a city. I didn't like the show, but I do feel like, isn't that appropriation? Like, it feels wrong somehow. So I, I think it's a, it's so difficult. And it's a question for our time as we struggle as artists and writers um, to, to really try to come to terms with this. And who knows where it's going to go? It's very fluid at the minute. Um, and I also think that we, we also have to remember um, that there's a, an enormous power structure underneath all of this, and that that being white, it's very difficult to say that somebody who is black shouldn't shouldn't be offended. We cannot speak for their experience. And being a thin person, I can't I can't necessarily speak for somebody being offended because I've used the word fat. It's. <laughs> Well, I think that that's what I'm saying. As, as a writer, you try and write to the human heart, whether it's a dark heart or a light heart or all the shades in between. You try and write to that heart, and that's the best you can do. Because if you take away that idea of a universality, whether it's in dance or art or music, you take away the, this idea that there's something that connects us all, that's similar to us all, that we can all feel and resonate with, I think that we're fractured beyond redemption. So anyway, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So. One question. Hi, <laughs> Chair. I really, really always enjoy your characterization. It's incredible how you do actually inhabit the characters. And I think that your life experiences and all the places that you've been, it's, it's really neat that, that we can identify them having not necessarily been there. But we can take them as individuals. But the one that puzzled me is the, um, the drug people. And it's been a while since I read the book, but, and I don't remember their names. How on earth did you? I mean, other things seem to be a part 
part of your life, you were a mother, or, so you had the kids, you had a career, so you did that, and you lived in Africa, so you knew about that part of things, and you're living here now. But that the drug, the, the druggies there, how did you bring those out so well? Um, <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, uh, I, I wanted to be very careful that I, I did not want to write about a drug addict from a drug addict's point of view. I, um, I'm, I'm aware that I don't quite understand people who are caught in addiction. My father was a terrible alcoholic, um, and he died at 54 from sources of the liver. He couldn't stop. So I wanted to write about the fallout on the people around that sphere of addiction. Um, and we obviously see and read that every single day where we live, where we're aware of families that are separated, families that are falling apart, kids coming into the school system who have all these issues. Um, we know the burden that addiction is. Um, and I, I wanted to, f to really try and write about what it was like for the people on the periphery of that, both the child, Jake, um, but also Ben, who in his own way was a, a victim of his mother's addiction and grows up to become a drug trafficker, but is really only a drug trafficker because he can't make ends meet in the Northeast Kingdom and, and is unable to see the irony of what he's doing. Um, so in my murky past, I had dated some drug addicts. So I was a little bit aware of like some of the things that, that went on. And, and, and to be honest, reading the local paper, talking with journalists, doing some research, um, and I completely came up with the log thing on my own. Um, whether, I don't know. Anybody wants to smuggle drugs to Canada inside of logs, I don't know. But um, um, So it, it was, again, a sort of combination of personal experience and, and just reading the local paper a lot. And, and as I said, talking, talking with a couple of the local journalists who had really been covering the opioid ep epidemic. Because they really did become people. They were more than just and, you know, They did have personalities. Yes, I mean, I think that's the, that's the problem with anybody who's addicted. They are, they are their person, but they are like wrapped in almost like this plastic wrap. They're like in, in this addiction, so you can kind of see in who they are, but they don't move or act like a normal person. They're, they're so wound up in this addiction. Um, I, I did actually have this one other thing that um, I got from a, a Boston paper, um, and, and it actually, a p part of it come in, comes in the book, and when I start writing, I, I put things up on the wall, like the, the photograph of the trailer um, and this is Isaiah 9, loves to draw, paint, and build. And he is Sunday's Child is a, a weekly column featuring a child currently in foster care awaiting adoption. So it says here, Isaiah, Isaiah struggles with staying focused and learning how to be part of a group. He can be easily distracted and unable to concentrate for extended periods of time. Isaiah can struggle with appropriate peer interactions as well but has shown significant improvement in, in settings that provide a high level of structure, clear expectations, and firm redirection. Isaiah has a significant trauma history and requires weekly therapy, including individual trauma-focused therapy. Has, oh, individual trauma-focused therapy has been beneficial in helping Isaiah focus coping skills and containment. Isaiah's creativity and willingness to engage has allowed him to process trauma through play and narrative therapy. therapy. Legally freed for adoption, Isaiah can do well in any type of family that will allow for a slow transition. So every Sunday, there's one of these kids, and we know that our community is full of these kids, and it broke my heart. Like, what did someone do to this boy? I mean, a significant trauma history. Like, what do you do to a child that they're broken by the time they're nine? Um, there's just something completely unforgivable in that. Um, and I think that there's an anger in my book, um, and it's certainly an anger, I think, directed at addicts that may or may not be appropriate. Um, but um, anyway. <laughs>
It, it may or it may not be. I think addiction is something very difficult to understand. Other questions? I'm just curious if you ever solved the mystery of the hole in the wall. I, I, I didn't, and I've never really told anyone about it, but people bought the house after them, and I was always curious to ask them, did you find that? Like, Maybe they had it papered over, or no, I never did. And, and the, the truth of it is I never saw those people the same again. But now that I have my kids, I could completely understand that somebody was just like, you know, or even my husband, like, um, you know, we, we reached those breaking points that we never ever thought were out there before we had kids. So, anyway. They do grow up. <laughs> And then they come back and clean and do their la do your laundry for you, right? Okay. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely one of the creepiest parts of the book. When I was reading it, I thought Kay was going to go through the hole and find one or both of the couple who, who kind of mysteriously also disappeared. Or the woman disappeared, I think. Yeah. And I thought she was in there. Yeah. It took me a while to, to read on on it. I can't believe that that, that you um, you were in the house where that was a, a real thing. That's so creepy. <laughs> <laughs> the table didn't even think like, oh, somebody actually was like that. You didn't just make that. <laughs> don't you think we all have our own closets oh, where we put stuff in them? Yeah. Though? I mean, if yeah, you we look at it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing as a writer. It's like everybody thinks that the stuff that you put on display is your closet. Like, this is my weird shit, but it's not. Really? I have other stuff, but I'm never going to be that honest and share my really, really bad stuff. <laughs> Are you working on another book? I've told my agent and the publisher that I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. So. A final question? My husband was doing some electrical work we were doing in the bathroom and he was coming in with the electrical wires from our storage area. And underneath one of the boards in the storage area, he found a condom wrapper and a ripped up note. And we have wondered what was going on with that. We couldn't really piece the note together and like, there's questions in our house too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people are just, people are weird. Like even normal people are weird. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think like my next book, I think I will just back off the pedal of darkness just a tiny bit. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I did, I did find myself somewhat warped um, by the end of the process of writing this book. So and it won't be about fairies, or, but it will. <laughs> I do think sometimes too that, uh, at least this has been my experience, the kids that uh, I end up that have ended up having like two, uh, it's like they were designed to just challenge you in the way that you are least best in dealing with. Yeah. So they were just special genetic miracles. <laughs> Here's the good news: my my husband is taking the kids to their English grandparents for two weeks over Christmas, and I'm going to be left by myself. <laughs> And people are like, well, won't you be lonely? Won't you miss Christmas? No. Are you kidding? <laughs> I will be able to not wash dishes for seven days, and there will only be seven plates in the sink. It will be absolutely incredible. So anyway, but um, thank you. Don't you think it's interesting that we can now save these things? Because yes. I think my mother's generation could not no, I, I think that that, that was in, in entirely un, unhealthy because I think we we were so set up to have this idea of how we should behave that when we become unraveled, we do we think we're horrible, horrible people. There are horrible people. There are horrible parents, right? I remember that when the, the babies were little and I had 
I couldn't sleep, I was having terrible insomnia, and I finally went to this shrink because all of other meds weren't working, and I'm going in there with these two car seats, and I put the car seats down, and they, he looked at me, he's like, there's nothing wrong with you mentally. He said, you're just exhausted. He said, the best you can do is keep them safe. Feed them, keep them clean, buckle up their car seats, and he said, that's all you have to do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, you don't have to sit there for five hours reading them baby Einstein. Einstein. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it was, is, a, is, a, is a dangerous, and, and I would argue that, too, with this idea of what Vermont is supposed to be, that if we pretend that it's something that it's not, we don't look at the problems, and we don't embrace them and look at feel like they're ours, like, well, we can deal with this because we all see this and it affects us all. We just want it to be a pretty thing. So. Anyway. <laughs> well, thank you. Th thank you, Bob, for inviting me. Um, and I actually didn't read that much from the book, but I, this is a new thing that I'm trying, so please feel free to give me feedback on how it worked, and I kind of lost the plot a little bit halfway through because I couldn't read my notes. Um, <laughs> But thank you. Thank you.